You from French originally? I can't. I, everybody's no, stories is Lubbock. Lubbock. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was born in Memphis, Texas. Okay. We, and then, when I was four, my dad got held out two years in a row. He was a farmer, uh. and uh, he moved to Lubbock, and so I was raised in Lubbock. Okay. Now, uh, you grad? Did you graduate high school or? Okay. 1965. 1965. Bubble High School. And did you uh, did you join or were you drafted? I was drafted. I always said those in the no take two and go. <laughs> what does that mean? Tell me. Two years. Oh, okay. As opposed to four. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yes, I was drafted. What? It, you got you have family where you were. Was everybody watching that mailbox anxiously, or what happens when you could when you can be drafted? Well, we when I was first drafted, my grandmother had colon cancer, and they operated on her and all. So I got it postponed, and then. Uh, she died in, in the funeral, and a week later I had my draft notice. <laughs> they didn't wait. I said, they keep track of you pretty good. I hadn't even contacted them yet to tell them. You know, by law, you got 10 days, I think, or something like that to tell them, but I already had my draft notice. How hard was that on your, your family? What? Well, you know, my mom had just lost her mother, and then he couldn't believe it. My dad, he said he'd go for me if he could. Uh, he was a nurse in World War II. Oh. And so, but they had, I had a little brother and his name was Tony. We won't discuss him too much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my mother, she went to work at, uh, first pie kitchen for her time, you know, since I was drafted. And I said, well, at least I'll get to see some country. And Dad said, yeah, that's a good attitude. So I said that I'd get to see some country. And so I came from Lubbock to Amarillo, got on the bus. We went to El Paso. Fort Bliss is where I took my basic training. Finished my basic training, went to Fort Seal, Oklahoma for artillery training. Went to Vietnam, came back to Fort Hood, Texas. I said, man, I see a lot of country. <laughs> <laughs> An experience, I was an old man when I got over there, you know, most of them was 17, 18, 19. I was already 21. Huh. And I was uh, married uh, about a year and a half before I got drafted. I think I just heard your phone. Shouldn't have phone oh, turned it. Me, let me turn this off. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it's all right. That's not a problem. I just wanted to get it before you got into telling me a story. It's completely off now. Okay. I got a question for you about your about your dad. Have, where was he a medic when he was in the war? He was over. Uh, he was in Japan. Okay. And he. Actually, I've got a pistol that he took off a, a German. He's straightening you up. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I need adult supervision. So you've got a pistol he took off a what? A dead Japanese soldier. Okay. And uh, it was the holster. And it was a Browning. <laughs> okay. And. It, 
it still fires and everything, but you know, it's just a keepsake. My little brother wanted it and Dad said, no way, you didn't serve in the military. So Dad, before he passed, he made sure I had that gun. My little brother tried to make it like I stole it. Oh. I said, well, think what you want. <laughs> Did your dad try to talk to you a little bit about what he thought you were getting into? He did a little. We uh, we didn't talk a whole lot about it, but like I said, he said if he could, he'd go in my place. So yeah. But uh, okay. So how old are you when you when you get your orders to go to Vietnam? Twenty one. Okay. Yeah. And and what were you assigned then to do? I was assigned assigned to LZ Debbie, which is right outside. Back then it was called Duck Foe, and it was an artillery base. What's it called now? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I hadn't looked at a Vietnam yeah. map in a long time, but it was right outside of Duck Foe, and uh, it was down south. It wasn't up, up in the north part. But I, that night, because I was trained in artillery, that was my MOS, that was my AIT. And so I got to that base, and that night we were overrun by zappers. Which are? Which are the enemy that's strapped explosives. Uh, to their body, you know, they knew they were going to die, but they were coming to get us. Is kind of like the kamikaze pilots. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they came, they busted through the Constantina wire, attacked. I hadn't even got a weapon yet. And so I was hiding. Of course, I was quite a bit smaller than I am now. Uh, and then after that, we got. Where the, did you hide? Any place I could. <laughs> <laughs> it was behind a bunch of sandbags, but oh. I was just hugging the ground, hoping they didn't get that close to me. But, yeah. Uh, the good Lord looked over me and kept me safe. Okay. Through the entire trip to Vietnam, I guess. Yeah. But. He, uh, it was quite an experience your first day there and didn't get overrun, you know. I said, I ain't ready for this. <laughs> and so the captain, he called me in to talk to me the next day. I thought he was going to sign me my weapons and all of that stuff. Uh, he gave me some weapons, and then he gave me a P-25, uh, which is radio. So he said, you're going to an infantry company as a radio telephone operator. You're going to be the recon sergeant. No call-in support and all of that. I said, sir, I don't even like to talk on the telephone. So he, uh, it didn't, that didn't hold much water. <laughs> didn't change his mind, huh? It didn't change his mind. So I, I went and I was assigned to the 3rd and 1st Infantry Miracal Division and I met my medic. Uh, we'll get into that. But we got where well, we tied our poncho liners together. And, at night when we made a perimeter and were supposed to sleep. But uh, we were with the command platoon because he was the medic and I was the radio operator. And he, it was Captain Tyson, he was the, the commander and he, they called us Tyson's Terrors. 
he kind of made the rules as he went along because they made so many rules that we couldn't do like if a Vietnamese was running across had just left a tree line and was running across the open deal. You couldn't shoot at him unless he was shooting at you. So most of us carried an ex an enemy weapon, an AK or something. And uh, he just set a booby trap in there because we'd go in there and find it, and then we'd plant the rifle on his body. You know, fired a couple times so it was fresh. Hmm. Nobody ever checked. But you know, it's uh, the news media. They they talked about us winning. Uh, we didn't win, but I was doing what my country asked, and I, and I'm proud of it. I signed that oath when I was drafted, and to this day I'll defend and protect this this land because I'm not able to go anywhere but if they come over here I'll definitely be doing something but okay. I, I'm proud to have served even if I was drafted and and it's just you know there's some good memories and bad memories right and yeah. there's some smells that you never forget, you know. Such as? Uh, well, you go into a place and see these dead bodies piled up and you smell all of that. And it's not, there's nothing pleasant about that. No. And you, you, you sit there and you wonder when you're first in country, you, you're wondering, well, what happens if I actually have to shoot somebody? And then when that time comes, you uh, say it's either him or me. And so if you have the choice, well, it's going to be you that's going to come out of this, okay? But it's, uh, it's a hard thing to do because you talk all your life, thou shall not kill. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, but I was I was able to do it, and that's not a part that I'm proud of. But we were protected and doing what our country asked. Uh, my first actual combat, we were in the field there's 28 of us assigned to go with this track of or with these tracks you know they had 50 caliber machine guns on them and uh, we were riding on these tracks on patrol at one time there the our track had some engine trouble or something so it pulled over and he was the commander of the whole platoon of tracks and he was called the warlord that's what he had painted on his track well just so happened the one that was behind us he went around to take the lead and it it was named the eve of destruction <laughs> now i know we've all heard the song but this put some meaning somewhere because when he went around us, he went down into a creek bed and the member that uh, that track was hit by three rocket propelled grenades. And of course I looked around, I thought something had just happened and it, it had just happened, but it, I didn't realize what it was. Well, the next thing I know, I turned around and the commander said, we're in contact with the enemy. You need to get off. And I looked down the barrel at 50 caliber and I dove off into the rice paddy. 
and lost my steel pot and and then I guess I lost my rifle somewhere in there. Still had my radio, but I I went and uh, I heard the guys screaming. Some of them lost legs and arms and stuff like that. But I made five trips to that to the eve of destruction and carried five people back behind the air tracks to safety and. We, then we called in a medevac to get them out, and we, what we would came in contact with, we found out later, was a whole entire NVA battalion. North Vietnamese Army? Yep. And so we were pinned down, I found my rifle and pulled it out of that rifle. Patty, and it it still fired. I said, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but we were pinned down pretty much. We couldn't go anywhere, and we sure wasn't going to go to that creek bed. Uh, after that, it was... We had this general look like a fly way up there on the ceiling, you know, flying around. He was telling us to move, uh, and he said, you can control the enemy. Well, we had a whole MVA battalion, so if we moved this way, we were going to be on one end and the rest of them could move in on us. Any way we went, it was a catch-22. but. Captain Tyson, he heard what the general was saying. He grabbed that mic, I guess is what you call it, with the handset. Told me to give him that radio. And he, he asked the general what he was talking about. And the general said, you need to move. He said, i tell you what, sir. If you fly that helicopter down here real close to our position, he said, I'll blow your out of the sky myself. And he said, we're pinned down. We can't move. Next thing I knew, that helicopter was flying away. <laughs> but we were in combat for 11 hours. Mm. And that's where I was put in for this bronze star that I proudly wear. And I'm proud of it. But it uh How many casualties did you take? Well, there was twenty eight of us that went on this mission. And there was eight of us that returned. You know, there's we never heard about the ones that we put on the medevac. So you had some injured out of that yeah, and some that, killed. Yeah, but they they would never come back to the field anyhow because everybody I carried had lost a foot or an arm or a hand or something. Cause, and uh, it's, it's quite the experience your first time and then, uh, but 11 hours, in combat, and you get initiated real quick. You can't but, sleep, close your eyes. No, uh, -uh. and then when I called in the, we called in an airstrike. We tried with the artillery, and it didn't do. And when I called in the airstrike, man, you you were just puckering up because they, they came in from your rear and they they were shooting and then bullets just whizzing over your head and you know they had them mini guns and all of that they were but you wonder how many were killed by friendly fire because that that sounded very close it was I mean it sounded like this 
right here. <laughs> Them bullets. <laughs> what were you thinking when you pulled those guys out? I mean, oh, did you have time to think, or is it, was it just instinct? Well, or? it's just instinct. Uh, uh, if I'd thought about it, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. I would have probably still done it, but, you know, it's just like, Anything, if you come up on a wreck and see somebody, you're going to try to help them. Uh, you know, I, whether it's the best thing or not, it got them where they couldn't, couldn't finish anything. Yeah. You know, they uh, even sitting behind the tracks with them with my medic, trying to stop the bleeding on all of them while I was calling in the middle of that. And they were screaming that they could still feel their leg and all of that stuff. They, they, it's somebody crying for help, you just got to go. And and that's what I told Cap when he'd put me in for Bronze Star. I said, I'm no hero. I'm no hero. I said, I just did what comes natural. I just. When were you the most scared? When was I most scared? Yeah, while you were there. I think when uh, uh, I was, we were on a patrol and we hit a, hit a uh, booby trap, which was a 500-pound bomb. And I got a little shrapnel in my arm and all of that, and I told my medic. He said he was going to put me in for Purple Heart, and I told him there's no way. I said, people losing their legs and arms, and I got a little bee. Well, it's a little bit bigger than that pellet gun, but I got that metal in there. He said, well, we're in combat, and you deserve it. I said, no. And he said, okay. Well, now everybody's talked me into trying to get it, so I'm battling with the Department of the Army. They want a medical officer to sign the papers. I said, well, there's no medical officer. The medic that treated my wounds sent a certified, notarized statement that he treated me, which in the field, the medic is the officer. If medical intentions, uh, you know, if you need a medevac or whatever, he's the one that gives the orders for it. It's not. And so we're battling with them on that. And I've got Congressman Thornberry working on that too. Working with Melissa Calcas, she's a wonderful person. Mm -hmm. But we have, uh, we, we did that and that was a pretty loud boom. I think we had, uh, nine people injured on that, but I wasn't that close to it. But if a sniper opened up, my buddy Doc Henion, his real name's John, <laughs> but he lives in Cordoba, Illinois. And I was in a meeting in uh, Springfield, Illinois, Vietnam Veterans of America meeting. And a guy, I gave a little talk at the place and someone tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, I served with Larry Barnett from Lubbock, Texas. And I turned around and I said, Doc. And we, we contact each other every, every year and he's where he can drive, and it's been about two years now that, since he came to see me, but 
a lot of Vietnam veterans, they don't talk about Vietnam. I got over it. Uh, I couldn't stand going into a store and a group of Vietnamese sitting there talking Vietnamese. I'd, my wife would leave me because I'd walk up and tell them, you're in America, speak American. And, and you know, I was, I was very bitter, I'd say, but after 27 years and then I met Doc, that's the first my wife knew of what I really went through in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And if I hadn't met him, she probably still wouldn't know. I probably wouldn't be doing this interview. But I think the word out to the younger people and the sacrifices that many veterans before me have made and the ultimate sacrifices that many have given their lives for. I think that's something that ought to be respected. Uh, I get tears in my eyes every time that a little girl or a little kid, you know, can't be very old, but their parents have taught them they'll see me with my cap. They'll come up and say thank you for your service. And what I, what I see it now, you know, because when we came home, they just soon throw rotten tomatoes and eggs and all of that at you because we were baby killers and everything like that. That and so a once ungrateful nation has turned into a grateful nation, and I, I appreciate the attempts that's being made through Congress to take care of the veterans. I think. And I've thought this even before I went into the service, that our assistance to other countries would be more important if we assisted those at home, you know, because we got a lot of homeless and everything like that. But were that, you? Go ahead. Go ahead. No, finish. Well. It just, you know, it's an experience. You'll never forget it. I'm glad I've done it. And uh, I feel that everybody, even if they're in a wheelchair like me, ought to serve in the military, ought to give two years, you know. And I hear all the time, they, they, I'll see guys and I'll thank them for their service and stuff like that. He said, no, I did nothing. I never left the States or I was stationed in Hawaii or, you know, damn it. But you're serving your country. It don't matter if you're in a war zone. I would love to sit somewhere in the rear and <laughs> let y'all go do the fighting for me. But it's just a matter of how it's God's intent for what you did. And, you know, we we used some foul language over there because just didn't know. One time we were, I was on patrol and I was uh, in captain, I said, grab hands, so I grabbed hands and uh, next thing I knew, we heard an explosion and I, I had a hand. And he was in a lot of pieces. Hmm. And, uh, you know, experiences like that, you can't forget. That's why we have the nightmares, PTSD, and all that stuff. A lot of people don't realize that when you go through that, and PTSD can be caused to a regular individual just because something traumatic happens to them. Right. You know, a big car accident that kills family members or close friends. It's not something 
that you can control real easily and and they're on uh you know they give you medication for it and my wife decided that I didn't need the medication so she stopped it and five days later she said I'd stop some pills because she fills up my pill box and all of that but I've decided you need it and she told me never to go off of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> hmm. so she understood that the medication was doing some good. Right. Because she, uh, when I came home from Vietnam, my first wife had the sheriff deputy with divorce papers waiting on me. And hmm. so we got a divorce the first part of August 1970 and then I met my wife actually she was her and her sister were coming out of church and me and my buddy we were coming off a of drunk <laughs> <laughs> so I took her off the streets <laughs> That's my story, I'm sticking to it. But she, uh, and then we got married January 4th, 1971. And one time she decided to wake me up and I just came up, my natural instinct uh, knocked her on the floor. It was not intentional. But uh, then when she decided to wake me up, she did it with a broom handle. <laughs> and so, and she didn't realize over these years, you know, till I started going to VA and asking for help and all of that because I was getting kind of dangerous, I would say. And. You know, uh, went to the wall, and then you wondered why your name wasn't on the wall. Things like that. It's. It took me setting up on a hill. It was eight hours before I actually went down to the wall my first time. Eight hours just sitting beside it, but not going? Not going close to it. Uh, what was stopping you? I don't know, but I had a good brother. His name was Don Kennedy, and he was there right beside me, and he understood. And he said, but you got to go down there. That's going to. So I went down there. And it was an awesome experience. Tears flowed, and they flow every time I go. But if I'm, I don't know when I'll be back up in that area, but if I'm within 30 miles of the wall, I'm going to the wall. As you know, we're bringing the, the wall yes. uh, replica here. How do you think that will uh, be for folks who are in service and also to teach other people about? I think that a good thing. You go do it at Lion Oak Cemetery? We're going to do it at Southwest Park so we can have a lot of parking. Oh, and oh okay. Yeah. Southwest Park. They had it at uh, Lion Oak Cemetery. Years ago, yeah. And I was then state president of the Vietnam Veterans of America. and. Chuck Norris and Kay Bailey Hutchinson came and they wanted me to escort them down the wall. And that was an experience. I enjoyed it. Uh, and it was amazing to find out that Chuck Norris had a brother that was on the wall. Hmm. And, you know, nobody, you never heard anything about that. Right. And, 
but he did a lot of the war movies and stuff. But uh, he said during that visit that when we were there at his brother's name, of course he got a rubbing of, of it, and uh, he said he took his mother to Washington and he was going to take her to the wall. And he said, she got out of the car, and he, he hadn't even came around to assist her yet. And when he got there, she was already going. And she walked right down to that wall, right to his brother's name, and put her hand on it. Huh. And she had never been there before. He said it was unbelievable, but that's what my mother did. You've worked with, uh, you've talked to school groups and things like that. What do, and we're doing um, school curriculum as part of this. What, how will that benefit uh, or help this situation and bring understanding? Well, when we talked to four senior classes here not too long ago, and uh, it was at Caprock High School. And there's all seniors. There was a couple. One was going into the Navy and one was going into the Army. And they listened intently to what was said. Uh, it was a very rewarding experience, you know. And there at Caprock High, they they welcomed us and the teachers come by and they thank us for our service. And, you know, it was just amazing what. And those kids, their teacher said that the quietest they'd ever had them in class. What did they want to know? They didn't really ask a bunch of questions, really? but they listened intently. And, uh, you know, I, years ago I talked to some the younger kids, not the high school kids, and that was, I don't believe that's worthwhile. You need to get them where they're able to understand what you experienced. And, and I'm behind them. You know, now our service is all volunteer. There's no draft. But yeah. there could be if they choose to reinstate it. Depends on what North Korea does. But the younger kids, they want to know things like, did you shoot anybody? Did you get wounded? Can we see the scars? And I said, you know, it's like a three-ring circus. But I was glad to do it for the teachers and stuff. and. A lot of things I, I talked, when we spoke to the high school kids, I said, at night, when you go to bed and you fluff your pillow good and everything, you just remember that you have that right because several during my time and before me and now are fighting for you to have that right to lay your head on the pillow. I said, we laid our head on the steel pot, our helmet, and that's not very comfortable. And I said, you got very little sleep. It was, but every time you see a veteran, thank him for his service, thank him for your freedom because that's, that's what our brothers who gave the ultimate sacrifice, they, they've, they've earned it. Respect them at the service, uh, Veterans Day, everything. We, we just have to do that. Also, uh, another thing that I've done is 
Hank Thornberry's called these warrior town hall meetings. I spoke at the first one. And that's kind of a deal. You have 10, 15 minutes to tell your story. And it was just, it's not a question and answer. But uh, I gave my story, and it didn't take me 10 minutes because I shortened it quite a bit. But I was amazed after it was over that how many people came up there and shook my hand and enjoyed it. Uh, that I'll speak, spread the word, try to get it out for educational purposes, you know, because war is war. Like one time I was in the VFW, and this World War II veteran, he was, they didn't think we belonged to the VFW because it wasn't a declared war. So I told him, I, he said, I was in the big one, WW2. I said, well, I was in the long one. <laughs> and, you know, and I said, but I want to tell you something, declared or undeclared, if I go out the door of this VFW post and somebody starts shooting at me, there's going to be a war. <laughs> so uh, I'm not going to declare it, but there's going to be a war if somebody starts shooting at me. Well, uh, Larry, thank you for your service. You bet. Thank you. It was an honor and a privilege, and I'm proud to have done it.